All right. Van Lathan is here. Wesley Morris is here. Our, my old Grantland teammate now at the New York Times. This is a very important movie for me. I know I say that a lot in the rewatchables, but this is a really important movie for me. Eddie Murphy was my guy. He was coming off Harlem Nights in 1989, which was uh, critically savaged. And then 48 Hours 2 in 1990, the much anticipated sequel to one of my favorite movies of all time. And he's 15 pounds overweight. And kind of doing a Reggie Hammond impersonation. And it it's just a bummer. And this was like, Eddie, come on, get your shit together. Two years pass, Boomerang comes out. I didn't realize till I did the research for this movie, I always thought it was a beloved movie. It was not beloved when it came out. Wesley, what do you remember about the reviews to a movie that, by the way, did really well and made like 70 million bucks and should have been reviewed better? Um... Well, the reviews, I think, kind of weren't ready for the kind of comedy this is. I think people were expecting it to be like a Nora Ephron movie, but black. And instead, they just got a black movie. And I think, you know, there were what black people were reviewing this movie in 1992, for one thing. Um, None. I don't how about know. Zero? How about zero? I don't know what Jet said, but I'm sure that like they were all, I'm sure Eddie Murphy or Robin Givens or somebody or Halle Berry was on the cover of Jet. Um, so, but I remember not critically, but I mean, Van, I don't know if you remember this, but like there was enormous pressure. It was like, this was the early nineties when every, it happened like four times a year, a black movie would open and your entire family Mm -hmm. All your friends, you all have to go to the movie and, you know, prove that you saw it. <laughs> You're, you couldn't be more right. I, like, I was watching BET's Video Soul. Oh, Video Soul, please. Video Soul. And it was, uh, and I think it was Martin Lawrence that was sitting down because this movie is also a very important milestone in the career of Martin Lawrence. Uh, yeah. like Martin Lawrence was sitting down, he was talking to Sherry and he said that he was in a movie and uh, the movie was starring him, David Allen Greer and Eddie Murphy. And my mother went, huh? What is that coming out? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I was like, 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 it was all of them in one movie. And I was like, oh, for real? So like, I remember this is back before the age of knowing exactly what release date for every movie was coming out in 2024, 2022, and all of that stuff like that. Um, and there was a great degree of anticipation for the movie with all of these people in it. So it was definitely a cultural event uh, at Bar Marche Mall in Baton Rouge to go and like watch this movie at the show. It was a huge, huge deal, and we, and we loved it. Maybe at 11... Or 12 at the point. I maybe I shouldn't have been watching it, but we went to the movies and I did. So the director, the director, Reginald Hudlin, he actually says on the set in one of the stories that someday people are gonna be amazed that all of these people are in the same movie. Yeah, and I mean it's, we're talking 28 years <laughs> later. And I've seen this, I'm not kidding when I've seen I I've seen this movie 30 times. This is yep. one of my movies. I'll watch this every year. It gets more unbelievable by the year how many people are in this movie. Like, in bit parts. Like, Chris Rock's barely in the movie, and it's fucking Chris Rock. He's, like, the 10th lead in this. But then you think, you talked about how Martin Lawrence, how what an important movie it was for him. It's weirdly an important movie for every single person in the movie. Like, we mm -hmm, always do, mm -hmm, we'll do Apex mm -hmm. Mountain later, and we're like, what's the apex of somebody? This movie, everybody who's in it has some sort of stake. You know, like it mm, launches yep. Halle Berry. Halle Berry becomes Halle Berry from this movie. It's the last good thing Robin Givens does. It's the mm -hmm. best movie David Allen Gray ever made. It's a movie that launches Martin Lawrence's TV career and his movie career. Um, yeah. It revives Eddie Murphy as this guy we were, who was like this LeBron-like talent that we were disappointed in who now circles back and it's like, oh yeah, that's LeBron putting up 35, 12, and 15 in a game. What am I missing, Wesley? Um, I mean, this, I mean, there are the sort of ancillary things where it's a, it's a big moment for black people. <laughs> it's a big okay. moment for black people who want to be in movies and who want to see black people in movies. And I think that the pressure, it's weird that this movie doesn't feel like there's any pressure on it when you watch it. 
Um, but the pressure on the movie to to not just be good, but just to make money to satisfy whoever gave them the money to make the movie in the first place. Um, that pressure was enormous. And it's funny watching it now with no pressure on it at all, how just, I mean, this might be one of the problems with the movie. We can talk about this later, but like it is, it is so, it is so carefree and it is, it is so only interested in being the thing that, that these people who are making this, like Tisha Campbell, like Tisha, well, whatever we can do, we can go back to Tisha Campbell, but like the way that she functions in this movie is so, it's just such a black movie. It's so black. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and so Van, oh god, sorry, god. I just, I was, I just, I just, it, I, I was surprised by that. Was the thing I could only appreciate at this remove. But as a kid, it was just like, oh well, this is just like being in in the cafeteria at school. Mm. So we're talking a six year stretch that leads to this movie, where you have the birth of Spike Lee's career, you have House Party, you have Hollywood Shuffle, you have. Raw, directed by Robert Townsend. You have Boys in the Hood. Mm -hmm. It's a six-year arc to a mainstream Eddie Murphy movie that's trying to basically rejuvenate his career in a little bit of a way, but also is an all-black movie. And mm -hmm. this is the first mainstream all-black movie ever. They In the research, it's the most expensive black movie ever to this point. It's like $40 million. Mm -hmm. Most of the... Most of the movies that were either all black, mostly black, whatever, were always smaller budgets, things like that. This one, they go all in. Van, you're not going to believe this, but there was a backlash to this in 1992. I, I know you're always shocked. <laughs> I know you're always shocked when, wow! when maybe white America received something incorrectly. But uh, in 1992, people were upset and didn't understand and felt like it was racist that there was an all black cast. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that also has to do with their relationship with Eddie Murphy, right? Because, um, you know, it, it, Eddie Murphy was seen, it's very funny, there's a scene in, um, in, in Do the Right Thing, where it's a very famous scene in Do the Right Thing, where uh, John Turturro is talking to, Spy, uh, to, to Spike Lee, and he actually mentions Eddie Murphy and Michael Jackson uh, as being more than black, right? Mm -hmm. These guys are more than black. Those guys aren't really black. They're not black. They, they, they're more than something. They're something different uh, than, than black. Um, and that's kind of a view that Eddie Murphy had in the 80s. Eddie Murphy was from Saturday Night Live. Eddie Murphy didn't exist to a lot of people um, in any specific sphere of blackness. Even though he had done movies uh, that were that dealt in themes of black, like Harlem Nights is definitely a black movie. I would even say that Coming to America is definitely a black movie and a celebration of not just blackness in America, but of blackness yeah. uh, going all the way back to Africa. But when you watch this film, which I describe, I describe Boomerang as delightful. It's a delightful movie. <laughs> That's the way I describe it. When you watch this movie, like when I rewatched it for this, for the purposes of this podcast, I automatically was overjoyed. The first scene of the movie is this professional, beautiful setting of these amazing looking black people, right? And I'm not talking any Kylie Jenner, Glamazon, yeah, Instagram. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about natural, beautiful, expressive, and, and, and successful Black people who, by the way, aren't harping on their place in America. They just doing their thing. And the movie is almost like you had Eartha Kitten that. You got Black royalty in this movie. You got the full gamut, generations of excellence telling a love story, right? And so... Uh, I, I kind of dig that, but I do understand how people might look at Eddie functioning inside of that movie and being like, yo, this ain't Reggie from Trading Places. Where where do we fit in? Like, where do like where like what's our part? How do we access this film? Like, how do we get into this film? I, I could see how they would feel that way. But I think, you know, when you have Eddie and 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 Hudlin and Chris Rock all up and down the line, really, for me, this movie. You talk about people at launch, it launched Leela Rashawn. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. she had come through with Harlem Nights, but this was the kind of the thing that kind of put her next. So, so it's like almost like a, a love story to black professional life. And I, I love it for that. Well, you think 
So you talked about Eddie belonging to everybody. We're just, we just, we're taping this the same week that the last dance just ended. And I, I do think there were Eddie Murphy, Michael Jordan parallels in a lot of ways. And I think Michael Jackson was like this too, although he was, he hit a whole other level of fame. But um, these people that for whatever reason just crossed over. And I think Michael was in a lot of the same boat, right? Like Michael couldn't have been in whatever his version of Boomerang was because people would have been like, what the fuck's going on? Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, mm -hmm. wait a second. Yeah, I thought you were more mainstream than this. And I do feel like this is one of the fascinating things about this movie. It completely changes all the choices Eddie Murphy makes from this point on. I think he really put a lot of thought, time, and energy into this choice that this is a, this is a new pitch in my pitcher's arsenal. I am now going to break out my slider. I'm going to be in a rom-com. You're going to watch me have sex with people. I'm going to be the old funny Eddie, but I'm also going to be romantic. I'm going to tap into all these. This is me. I'm hitting every piece of the Eddie, Eddie pie. And then people are like, fuck this. This movie is too black. This movie's racist. And Eddie writes an op-ed piece in the LA Times. Did you know yes. this? I forgot yes. to send yes. it to you last yes. night. Yeah. He writes an op-ed piece. He's so upset about the criticism of this movie that he, so he dismisses the reviewers um, who the reviewers are like, where, what is this world of upper middle class black professional life? It, this doesn't exist. How is this such a movie? an right. such an overtly racist, yeah. despicable? Right. Thing it's it's in there. Yeah. It's in the past. <laughs> right. um, it's like and, <laughs> and talks about Reginald Hudlin talked about there was a studio exec when they pitched this movie who he quotes as saying, "I don't know how you're going to make this work." Eddie Murphy is in a romantic comedy. He's got that broad nose and big lips. Like, this is where we were in the early 90s. This movie basically gets rejected, even though it makes 70 million and is one of the top 20 successful movies of the year. Wesley, does this completely change the arc of Eddie's career? If this movie's received better, do we tap into a different version of him as an actor instead of going down this, you know, the nuttiest professor route that we ended up in? Um, I wonder, but you know, I think it, well, no, because I think. I think he leaned into not being, I think he wanted to make everything he made as black as he could possibly make it after this movie. I mean, I, with, I can't think, I mean, there's probably some exception I'm not remembering right now, but if you think about um, Vampire in Brooklyn, which I think was after this, not a great movie, but like. It was after. Distinguished but, Gentleman and Vampire in Brooklyn were the next two. Uh, Distinguished Gentleman was a hit, um, but not. <laughs> Not a great movie. Not a great movie. But like, if you think about where he wound up at the end of the decade with life and the Nutty Professor and, um, I mean, Dreamgirls wasn't the end of the decade. That was the 2000s. It's the next decade. But Dr. Doolittle was in there, but Metro was in there. Yeah, Metro. There a couple of, uh, Metro was in there. Dr. Doolittle were in there. So there were Kinda definitely like a couple of... Uh, Metro was all right. There were definitely a couple of four quadrant family films that he stuck in there to make sure that that, that that things were going well. But nothing like this performance. And I almost feel the same way as I do about <laughs> Wesley's gonna laugh, but Will Smith and Focus. Where it's just like, <laughs> why aren't you this guy more often in a movie? Yeah. What, yeah. What's wrong no, no, with no, yeah. this persona? And this is really the only time Eddie went for it in a movie. This, what and you, he's what you're saying excellent. is he this is when he accepts his sexy. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that we saw, because like I, I remember when I saw the movie, I never thought about Eddie Murphy like that. Like, I, you know, like when I thought about the sexy black guys, remember, this was the era of 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 Denzel and Mo Better Blues to where like you would like my mom would watch Mo Better Blues and Denzel would be messing around with the 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 the, the trumpet and my mother would like audibly moan and my father <laughs> would be like my, my father would be like, OK, I'm going to cut this shit off. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't control, like if you can't control yourself, so there were a lot of of this time, kind of those guys, and you never thought about Eddie Murphy in that realm. But when you look at him in the movie, especially watching it now, yo, he was smooth as hell. It completely worked, and like it, 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 just, it was just something we had never seen from him. The only time I could think of it is Forty Eight Hours, when he's trying to hook up with the girl at uh, at the club when he's waiting for Nick Nolte to show up and he starts hitting yeah. on her and he's trying, and that's like really, 
they 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 try to do it in Golden Child, but it's it's super uh, awkward. They end up cutting it out, and it's yeah, probably no. the biggest flaw of that movie. And then Coming to America is basically like a Disney movie. Um, but but Bill, you're 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 omitting the most important romantic connection he oh, had. Oh, you're gonna do this now? I, All right, go ahead. <laughs> I, I mean, it's important. I feel like him and James Russo at the beginning of Beverly the Beverly Hills Cop, as we've discussed in a previous episode of this program, does it's not the, yeah. work if they don't have this connection. And he and James Russo lean into this connection in Beverly Hills Cop. And it's the animating, it's the animus of the entire movie. And it doesn't work if you don't believe that he has, that, that a loss has happened to him. So he, so you think when he's with Halle Berry and Robin Givens in this movie, he's really thinking of James Russo? Uh, no, because the kissing, <laughs> this is some of the best kissing I've ever seen in a movie. This is, oh, I've yeah. never seen, I have never seen a man and a woman kiss in a movie that was put out by a Hollywood studio like the kissing that happens in the, he is, they are eating each other's faces. It is, it's just amazing. I've never seen kissing like this before. And I'm a big tooth brushing, running and kissing are my three tells as to whether or not these people have done this before in a movie. And no. the kissing in this movie is just out of control. It pissed my grandmother off so bad. She was like, like, yo, she was like, that's real tongue he putting on. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's like, it's not just the kissing. It's like when Rob, like when Robin Givens and Eddie Murphy are having sex, oh, the yeah. sex scenes in this movie, she yeah. is going to work. Yes, yes. Like, yes. like my like she is going to work. Like, and that's kind of a thing about this film, is like for as breezy as it is, because it's a breezier love story, you know, you know what I mean? It's a it's it's it, it it doesn't go to the depths of it's not, you know, blue Valentine or anything like that. You know what I mean? It's a it's a breezier love story, but they they really don't pull any punches in terms of what it is that they show you or how aggressive they are uh about even some of the dialogue or some of the situations. Like, you know, Marcus Graham at the beginning of the movie is pretty like an unabashed scumbag. Like he says at the beginning of the movie. At the moment of orgasm, he loses interest in the one. Who says that? You know what I mean? Um, and so because <laughs> <laughs> I'm this not gonna lie. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it is it is a chemical, it is a chemical reaction. I'm sorry. It happens to every man. I I don't know. I mean, that was a, I was a teenager and could not have known how true this was. I'm watching yeah. this movie now and I'm like. Oh, well, that's just stuff that, that men talk about. That is that is a three-man conversation. And it just it is just a matter of fact. It is not mm. misogyny. It's just <laughs> it's 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 chemistry. It is chemistry. That's just what happens. Well, this movie really pulls off it pulls off two different movies, right? And it's a recipe we've seen over and over again where it's like, this guy's unlikable, but by the end of the movie, you're gonna like him. Basic premise, right? But in right. this, mm -hmm. it's like Boy, this guy's this guy really, really uses women and discards them immediately. But he's he's Eddie Murphy, so I'm supposed to like him. But then when things flip on him, it really works. I think the last 45, 50 minutes of this movie, when it really turns into a traditional rom com mm -hmm. and his whole world's been fucked up, and then he kind of ends up with Halle Berry, and then he fucks that up, and he's just adrift. It's about as successful of a swerve as you've seen in a rom-com. It's they, you know, and by the way, this is in almost every rom-com, right? When Harry met Sally has its version of it and you go on through and it's at some point, 75% in the movie, somebody's going to fuck things up and then they'll fix it at the end. This one, you're like really rooting for him to fix it with Halle Berry, partly because she's, you know, the best looking person probably who's ever been on a movie screen or in the top five. <laughs> You're like, Eddie, don't screw this up. Jesus, how did you miss it? Uh, Van, where would you rank this cast? And then Wesley, I'm getting your take too. The best looking cast of females ever in a movie. Mm. Number one. It's a one seed in the tournament. It, it, <sighs> it's it's number one. I mean, like there are other movies outside of the, like, you know, Sin City's up there. You know, with with Jessica Alba and Carla Gino and all of those people like that, like there's a, a lot of beautiful women in Sin City, and there are a, a lot of other movies that 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 have. She's the one. She's the one. Is the one that I think needs is also a one seed mm. in the tournament. 
Mm. That's she's got the one you said. Prime Aniston. It's got Cameron Diaz. Cameron Diaz, yeah. It's got Johnny Leslie Britton. Mann and um, Maxine Banks, and there's like three other people in it. Is Connie Britton in that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's loaded. Yeah. So that's a one uh, seed too. I don't know what the tournament is, and I know we'll never have it at the Ringer because, God forbid, you have fun with this. <laughs> right. But right. Boomerang's on the short list, well, without a doubt. Um, and like I said, women of all generations. Like you know, uh, Eartha Kitt still brings it. Like, yeah, Grace I, Jones. I, I, uh, Grace Jones does it for me too, man. Strong. I mean, like, I, Grace I, I, that... Jones. <laughs> Grace Jones. She's amazing in this. I mean, so. <laughs> You got something? It seems like you. No, you I say? just, I'm just, I'm just basking in the, in the, in the afterbirth, in the afterbirth of <laughs> Grace Jones. It's great. Grace Jones will be coming up later in a couple, oh, in a couple uh, of the she, categories. I'm sure she will be. Wesley, where, what's your, uh, what are your one seeds in the best looking female cast ever tournament? Uh, this is definitely up there. Uh, shampoo. Oh, um, that's a great one. Um. Totally but, I mean, shampoo. I feel like Sin City is complicated, right? Because it has to be, it can't be about casting people who, for their beauty, right? I mean, I don't know. I, it's got me, I'm gonna, this is, hey, I'm what gonna, are we talking about? Sin City's me, got Rosario, just the names, the Rosario Dawson, Jessica Alba, Carla Gino, uh, Jamie King. Like, Sin City is- I'm not cool. saying it's women. not true. I'm not saying the women in that movie aren't beautiful. What I'm saying is they're- the way that the movie, I don't know. It's, it it kind of matters how the movie uses them. I don't know. It, okay. I feel like Sin City gets an asterisk sniff to me. Um, but that PDs. is fair be, because they're, yes, that is all true. Um, but what else, what like number one seed? This is definitely, this is definitely a one seed. Um, Can I give you a LeBron 2007 Cavaliers one seed? Sure. It's just basic instinct. It's just Sharon Stone and Roxy. <laughs> they don't have anyone else, but it's just maybe some Gene Triplehorn getting some rebounds say, no and love, some picks. No love for Janine Triplehorn? Yeah, yeah. Like, All right, as, those a, three. as a six man? Yeah. That's a sleeper. Because Sharon mm. Stone's worth like three people in that movie. Yeah, no. <laughs> basic instinct's a good one. Uh, can we talk about Robin Givens? Oh. Bless, Wesley, why wasn't it. Robin Givens a bigger movie star? Is it was were was there just the Tyson thing was just too much. The difficult thing was too much for her to overcome. Cause she, every time I watch this movie, I just feel like she's one of those actresses, much like Sharon Stone, where she just walks into the room and just goes like this. And you're just, you're leaving with her and you don't even know where you're going. Yeah. So like, where are we yeah. going? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. I'll, I'll just follow you. Wait, your family's behind that. Fine. Fine. I'm just going to go with Robin. Robin Givens is, I mean, I won't, she's not a tragedy. I think the thing that happened to her is is really sad though. And it is essentially that, I mean, you guys can talk about what where you, where you fall on the Robin Givens culpability in the Mike Tyson relationship. Um, but I think that the public reaction against her this idea that she was a scheming, gold digging, conniving. She and her mother were these awful, evil people who were after Mike Tyson's money. It just was too much. And I think that a thing that happens, and this is why, this is why Boomerang is such a like, I it's like I might get a little emotional even thinking about this movie this way, but there's a thing that happens with black art that can and 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 and, and black culture in the in black people whatever we mean by a black community where if you fuck up or you're perceived by america writ large as having fucked up black people will take you in we'll take you back we'll 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 give you a second chance we will rehab you and i th i mean you know oj simpson is like nur plus ultra the example of this where you know we made a choice not so much about oj but about what he represented um or what he was made to represent by that trial um you know michael jackson is such a person um janet jackson after the after the nipplegate fiasco you're just um, speaking did, van's language right now he's, where, he's where all did, in he can't wait where did janet go janet went 
to, to, to make Tyler Perry movies. I think there was a real... Robin Givens was somebody who, as by being part of this experience, I think, I mean, I know as like a teenage boy, I was just like, oh, well, I mean, I already liked Robin Givens, but now I love her because she came home to us. She came back. She didn't have to come. She didn't have to be here. And I, I mean, she probably needed to do that as much as like we were happy to have her do it. But I think being in this movie it kind of, it lessened the stigma against her, if not in the rest of the country, then certainly among black people. Um, but she also played the villain, you know what I mean? She was Eddie Murphy's equal, but she also, if, if this movie has a quote, bad guy, unquote, it happens to be the woman who is the most free with her sexuality, the most um, sort of unencumbered by being successful, being black and being beautiful, she has no, there is no obstacle for her, for her progress in this corporate environment. Um, and if, you know, what she's acting in this movie is just liberation. Now, the downside of course is the hair because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of women left that movie being like, fuck that hair. God damn that hair. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I feel like Robin Givens deserved more than she got. I think the movie she she did a, she did Rage in Harlem before mm. this, mm -hmm. and I think I mean I don't. What did she didn't do anything after this? She wasn't in another movie. I mean, she was probably in. She didn't do anything near this level of of profile. You movie you ones. you just gave Van a bone with like three different pieces of giant <laughs> meat on it that he Take doesn't away, know what Van. to do with. Van, I don't even know where you go from that. Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, like A Rage in Harlem is the movie that awoken young Van to the wonders and beauties of <laughs> like a Robin Givens. It, like Robin Givens is hot in this movie. In A Rage in Harlem, Robin Givens is some sort of sexual deity she is so fine in that movie it's ridiculous um a couple of things about this the very first thing i ever heard about robin gibbons we remember i didn't watch head of the class a little too young to watch head of the class at that point uh the very first time i ever heard robin gibbons heard her name was somebody saying that's the bitch that broke mike tyson so mm. think about mm -hmm. it mike mm -hmm. tyson is the heavyweight champion in the world of the world at a time where being the heavyweight champion of the world still really, really mattered to black people, to America, whatever. It still was that guy. We hadn't lost it yet. We hadn't gotten to the mid-2000s where nobody could even name who the guy who had the belt was. So it was a big deal. And um, he mattered too in a, in a really unique way. In a really yeah. unique cultural way. You know, we weren't far too far removed from Ali. People still look to that position, to that guy for inspiration for whatever reason. Not saying that Mike Tyson was a huge, huge black cultural political figure, but he captivated the uh, uh, the 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 minds and the, the hearts and the spirits and the culture of everyone. We all know that. He was a big, big deal. Um, so looking at, at her as sort of the almost biblical temptress mm -hmm. uh, that took down this Samson figure is a hell of a hill to climb. A hell of a hill to climb. The first movie that I, the first thing I actually ever saw Robin Givens in to where I was like, oh, she's dope, was Boomerang. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I ever saw her in anything and I was like, oh, well look, well this is what the big deal is about. Cause like before I would look at it and I was like, uh, but now I can look at her and be like, okay, I can see what the big, what the big huge thing was about. I could see why Mike got played. I could see why all this, <laughs> I could see it. Well, like once you see it in these movies, like, I get it, Like I, that could happen to me. Um, when you add that, uh, plus the fact that, you know, Hollywood wasn't making black actresses into stars like that in the early 90s. I mean, it, it, you had a lot of actresses, like we're talking about Halle Berry being launched, right? Halle Berry's career being launched from this movie. The reality is that it would be almost another 10 years before Halle Berry reached the A-list. Now, if mm -hmm. we're talking about being a known, recognizable, leading woman in movies, that's one thing. But in, until Monsters Ball, until James Bond and Monsters Ball, we're talking about the end of the decade, the beginning of the next decade, 10 years. Till, Halle, till Halle Berry would reach the Hollywood A-list. 
We're talking about a time where Angela Bassett gets nominated for an Academy Award for Lo What's Love Got to Do With It, and that doesn't catapult her to the A-list. Doesn't happen for her like that. Like, it, 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 there, there was a very specific way that Black actresses, and really, which kind of persists even to this day, were, uh, were kind of looked at. There were no Sharon Stone moments. Sharon Stone, who built a career up, did that, had Bessie Instinct, and then boom, you're out of here. That just wasn't happening for most people. It wasn't. And so had everything gone right for Robin Givens, she still would have found a beautiful, talented, oozing with cinematic charisma, right? It's on display in this movie. It's on display in Erasure Harlem. Um, had everything gone right for her, she still would have been up against it. But also being the woman that led to the fall of a guy who was legitimately at, at one point as big as Michael Jordan or Bo Jackson or Magic Johnson, it, it, was, it, was, it was a death sentence for her career in a lot of ways. And we also, we didn't have all the information back then. It was just an know. easy way to explain it, to be like, this guy was invincible, and then he met Robin Givens, and now he's losing in Tokyo to Buster Douglas. It's her fault. And can the we Barbara Walters this interview for one second? Too. Yeah, I yeah. was going to say, the Barbara Walters interview, I, I just feel like, can you that guys, like, that was the thing that did her in, right? That killed yeah. her, yeah. Yeah. And and legitimately in some ways, too, because it it just was, she's so unlikable in that interview, regardless of what the circumstances were. The reality of that relationship is everybody lost, everybody behaved badly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there were no winners. There's no good guys in it. It's one of the worst celebrity relationships we've had. If OJ and Nicole are the 10 out of 10, it's it's like an eight and a half or a nine. But the uh, the Givens thing, you talked about how you didn't know her in head of the class. I remember watching her on that show. It was honestly the equivalent of like putting Sharon Stone from Basic Instinct in like a yeah. high school. <laughs> like she was she was in a she was in a different show. Like you yeah. you didn't know what was going on, but she's interacting with people in a way that just was not typical for 80s sitcoms. Like it, where there's sexuality even in that. So she's great. And then you have the Halle Berry thing. You know, the biggest flaw of this movie, which I, I really don't have a lot of nitpicks for, is Eddie's not supposed to realize how hot Halle Berry is for an hour and a half of the movie because she's really not wearing lipstick. That's the only, right, right. only read. Yeah. And then <laughs> all of a sudden she starts wearing makeup and he's like, what the fuck's going on? But it is a cosmetics a stretch, company, to yeah. be fair. It, he might not know any woman if she's not wearing makeup. It's fair. Um, we should also mention, because we got we're, we got to get to the categories at some point. One of the first great 1990s soundtracks. And during an era when soundtracks were kind of getting revived as a way to um, accentuate a movie, promote a movie, push a movie to the next level. You got early Tony Braxton on here. You have an iconic PM Dawn song on here. Oh, yeah. You have Boys to the Men, Boys to Men, uh, End of the Road. You get Johnny Gills on here, Tribe Called Quest. Like the the soundtrack was a piece of this when it came out. Everybody had the soundtrack. Oh yeah, I I mean I didn't my I had a roommate in high school. We listened to it all the time, and it was it was a pleasure. It was you know the Grace Jones song on that soundtrack. Yeah, is great. Seven Day Weekend. Um, mm. I mean the produce it was a babyface produced soundtrack with the uh, Dallas Austin. Um, some extra, like a little bit of Dallas Austin on it. And the PM um, Dawn song is in the, on the short list of greatest songs you could have had in a rom-com. Cause it starts out with the piano in the beginning. It sets a certain mood. Then he comes in basically acapella with just a little piano. Mm -hmm. And then it's the thought, the song is I die without you. Like you're, you're basically not coming up with a better hammer for, a rom-com song. I'm still in on PM Dawn, by the way. I still have all oh, my stock from the early Don't 90s. get out. Don't don't yeah, sell right. that. I still own all my stock. Wait, waiting for him to have a resurgence. So 40 million budget made $131 million. As we said, most expensive black movie ever at the time. Mixed reviews, even now, 49% on Rotten Tomatoes. So 51% of those people can fuck off. Um, <laughs> Roger Ebert, our guy. Three stars. Quote, Boomerang is powerful evidence that Eddie Murphy is back on track. It shows a kinder, gentler, funnier Eddie Murphy than we've seen in recent years. A comic actor who can go for the little laughs as well as the big ones and build a character. 
at the same time. I completely agree. I think this is Eddie at the peak of his powers. Go ahead, Wesley. Uh, I find it really interesting. I just, I'm just really fascinated by the negative reaction to this move, the sort of racially tinged, I mean, the racist and like racially tinged reaction to this movie. For one thing, I mean, Roger Ebert, I just feel like if you know any black people as Roger Ebert did, um, I just don't find this, this is not a strange experience. It's, it's just a movie. And then you can evaluate it as to whether or not it works on, on the terms of the movie that you're watching, right? Um, I don't think everything in this movie works. I, I, we can talk about what those things may or may not be. Tread carefully. But, eh, you know, it's not anything that you, that'll hurt your feelings. No, I but know. I do feel like the, the, the alleged foreignness of the movie is, it is just mind blowing to me that you, that you can't even begin to appreciate what is it or isn't working because you haven't been invited to the party. It's just, I don't think I need to say this, but like welcome to the movies for every single other person who isn't a white person in this country. <laughs> we learned, we never, I've, I've never left a movie. Compl- I mean, I have left movies complaining about how, other people are treated but i you know i didn't leave the natural upset that you know here was a here was a baseball movie about you know the perfect white man (laughs) didn't bother but i think you're talking about a decade where this is just slowly shifting not just in movies and tv shows but in sports too like this is you go alan iverson in 96 shows up oh my god people are like what the fuck's going on with that guy what's going on this hair what's going on this tattoos this is the course of the 90s. By the end of it, we start ending up in a better place. And now think how ironic it is now, like where black culture has become popular culture in so many different ways. It's just we weren't we weren't even close to even being in the on deck circle yet in 1992. And I you can feel it in those reviews. Yeah. It, it, so when like so when I, I remember watching the two quintessential Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movies, right? Sleepless in Seattle, and then later on, you've got Mail. It came back around to it, right? I love both movies, by the way. And I, was, well, I watched Sleepless in Seattle so many times that it never occurred to me that there are no black people in that movie, right? But you know who it did occur to? It occurred to them. Because by the time You've Got Mail comes on, yep. they shoehorn Dave Chappelle into yep. the movie for two or three weird scenes where mm-hmm. he just comes in and goes, hey, hey, this is us acknowledging that there are black people in New York. Just, we got Dave Chappelle. <laughs> like, we're just going to let everybody know we get it. We, we're acknowledging that this guy would have a couple of black people in his orbit. What I never understood, though, was why I was always expected to watch movies and just assume that there's a group of white people that don't know any black people, right? And why that, that same thing was never acceptable on the other side. Mm-hmm. There's a possibility that there are places, right? For, for example, there's another movie around this same time that's almost like Boomerang Light. It's kind of similar. Strictly Business also, oh, has, yeah. Halle Berry, Halle also Berry. has Halle Berry in it. Same type of deal. Black professionals, anything, a love story. Tommy Davidson is almost the exact Chris Rock character in this movie in an expanded role. Kind of the same thing. And, and at the end of the movie, the company gets bailed out by like a black bank. And that's when I realized as a kid that there were black banks with only black mm-hmm. people in them. Mm-hmm. And I, I watched the movie with my with, with my homies is like like some of my, my 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 friends from school and they they'd say stuff. They'd be like, like, what world is this? Or like, like where's a where's there a black bank where like I'm I'm telling you, Van, <laughs> the, the, like, you know what I'm saying? You, you say stuff like this. And it just, it speaks to the sense of entitlement sometimes that mainstream America feels like they have to our story. They feel like they're so entitled to everything that's been involved with or sort of uh, around blackness. Like this country is so theirs that we can't even take a, a couple of moments to tell a story that's just about us. Because where is that real at? And that's real all over the place. Now, Later on in the decade we talked about, there's another little resurgence of The Wood and Brown Sugar and Love and Basketball and movies that essentially 
took this playbook from Boomerang and then took them to the next level in a way in experiencing and exploring the depth of Black Love, even Love Jones and things like that. But at this point, they were saying, no, like you can't do that. Um, and that's why I think this particular movie, like even the soundtrack ushered in a golden era of soundtracks, right? Right after this, we're going to go to the Above the Rim soundtrack and the Set It Off soundtrack and the Way to Exhale soundtrack. Above the Rim. Like throughout, throughout the 90s, we're going to get all of these dope ass soundtracks. I don't think it could be understated how important this movie is um, in terms of what it did for Black culture. This was the first time beyond... I guess the Cosby show that I looked at all of these successful, beautiful, natural, amazing black people and like really felt inspired by it. And they were sexy and they were loud. They were everything that we are. You know what I mean? So I I, I, I Mm -hmm. dig it. And I don't think looking back on it now, we would make something like this and kind of be like, fuck you if you don't understand. But you're dealing with Eddie Murphy at that point who needed that, uh, who people wanted. They felt like they had to have a piece of him. It's interesting though, because you got 92 where rap is really going into the mainstream that year. You have In Living Color on TV. You have all these different pieces are in place. And then this movie comes out and everybody goes glass half empty on it, right? It makes 70 million bucks. It's a top 20 movie that year. But the story is, oh, an Eddie Murphy movie didn't open to number one in the box office for the first time ever. I wonder, wonder why that wonder is. why that could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. all this coded shit about presenting it like it's a failure. Meanwhile... It's the opposite of a failure. It ends up, it made $131 million. They spent 40 so it tripled its budget. And then, you know, they, they brought this back as a BET show. So there was a lot of boomerang stuff online last year about the movie and what it became. And it's really interesting, like, to, to these stories that people wrote about it, how this just became one of the essential Black America movies. And it's like, every Thanksgiving, my family watches Boomerang and shit like that, that if you go back and read the reviews, nobody had any idea it was going to unfold that way. I think people felt like this was a failure. And it's really weird. It do- it really doesn't add up. If you think about Eddie, with the, the amount of money it made, the, the stars that are in this movie or unleashed in this movie or breaking through in this movie, it's very bizarre that uh, people Not just the stars, the legends. So talk about stars, right? You talk about stars there and it's... But like then... If you were talking about Boomerang, you might not necessarily talk about like what a big star like John Witherspoon is, right? But the reality of the situation is a lot of what John Witherspoon became to people throughout the rest of this decade- Was from that movie, yeah. Was from this movie. With the jacket open, yeah. Yeah, like the bang, bang, all of that. It's from this movie. A lot of that legend, a lot of that legend of that insanely prolific and, uh, you know- talented man starts right here. This is the first time I ever saw him. So, you know, that's this, this movie is responsible for a lot, man, like in a real way. Well, let's let's go into the categories because we have a lot to cover. Most rewatchable scene. <laughs> I, I'm going to... It's tough to narrow this down, so I, I try to, but if I missed anything, feel free to throw it in. And we can also... We have What's Age the Best for some of the smaller stuff. The first lunch with Eddie Murphy, Marcus, and... David Allen Greer, when he's talking about once I hate it, I lose all interest, but it's my fault. They, uh, they're <laughs> Martin Lawrence is doing his asparagus spears thing. Why don't they call it Love asparagus it. tips? It's all racial. <laughs> uh, Eddie spots the hot dog walker in like five minutes. They really lay out all these guys in a really cool way. And I gotta be honest, like, I, I don't know if there was a movie before this that had, three black friends who were adults just talking about stuff like this. Zero. I, it, this had to be the first scene, right? Ever? Who weren't going to jail or talking about how not to go to jail or like how to evade the police. Never, never happened. Cause we had like do the right thing has some fun scenes with people talking, but it's not like this. It's just like three guys, normal hanging where nobody's life is in danger. No, yeah, doesn't, doesn't, does, does never happen. They do a whole chicks with dicks thing that's a little weird that has not aged great in this scene, but um, and also is a little, yeah. Um, no, I'll say it. Just don't even come on. Like it's transphobic. He, like, he <laughs> every every single thing that happens with homophobia and transphobia in this movie is like Eddie was like, I know what the rumors are. I'm I'm getting everything hey, out of here. Oh my I, god! I'm so glad you said that. I know Eddie, what the rumors are. <laughs> 
And I'm not going to be the person who has the fet this so-called fetish, but we got to address it. So, you know, Dan's dying right now. <laughs> David so Allen wrong. Greer, you got to take the hit. You got to take the hit. You got to take bro, the hit. Bro, that, bro, it's almost as if Eddie wrote that scene with a crystal ball knowing down the road what was coming. You know what I'm saying? Like, like this movie is, as much as this movie, this movie is, a part of this movie is Eddie Murphy going, just to let you guys know, I'm sexy and I get chicks. So what well, fuck what you've heard. And I'm like, I will have to talk about that. And that's like a big part of that, that scene because they go so hard in that on that scene, even watching it back, I laughed hysterically. And it's the first, it's literally the first bit of the movie. Right. The first thing they go into is that. And the the irony of how the next couple of years played out. I'll, I'll, we'll just yeah. leave that hanging. Leave um, that there. The next rewatchable scene, Marcus has to sleep with Lady Eloise and then goes <laughs> to work the next day and sees Robin Givens. This is like a perfect six minutes. Like the yep. the, yep. the reactions of the butler trying not oh. to laugh. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> fucking like, kills that me. That dude is so good. I, He's so I, I good. Was, in here laughing my ass off this morning. It is so amazing how awesome that guy is, man. And then he the, makes that scene. The turn up, can you turn down the lights? Can you turn down a little more? All that <laughs> stuff. And then her, him going to work the next day with Robin Givens. And then Eartha Kitt leaning into his ear. Yeah, I'm not wearing any underwear. It's just, it's it's just great. Uh next one. I personally, for most rewatchable, would just have the the brief thing when he sees Robin Gibbons for the first time and his head tilts and he does the whole, you're the, you're just breathtaking. You're, and she's just immediately like, Oh, great line. Um, but it, that could be a what's age the best next scene, Eddie and, uh, Robin Gibbons flirting at the party when she does the, when I seduce you long dramatic pause, if I decide to seduce you, don't worry, you'll know. I she, even Sharon Stone's like, fuck, that's good. That's good. I don't even <laughs> I don't even know if I could have pulled that one off. The, just the the electricity between them. And then he goes into work and Chris Rock's doing the office pool thing. And uh it's really great stuff. Can I just say the yeah. breeziness, like an essential component to this style of movie is self-confidence and breeziness. And the, the job of the screenwriters is to set up, set up a contraption by which two or three confident people have to somehow um, change course personality-wise, right? Like yeah. they, they are fully formed, developed people who believe that everything they say and do is correct. They've never been challenged before, but here is this immovable object in one of these two people and somebody's going to have to get out of the way. and. So if you've got a script that can handle that, you can cast the most confident person in the world to be as confident as they can possibly be. And her breeziness, like, no, she, he has never worked with a person who is as, as self-possessed as Eddie Murphy is. He's never worked with anybody who has no neurosis, who is, who is sure in every single thing she's doing, as sure as he is. He's never worked with anybody who has that. And that is the thrill of those scenes that you're watching somebody actually be able to like take it to Eddie Murphy. And well, the not- other thing is she she's tiny. I mean, yes. She's gotta be like five two, ninety-five pounds, hundred pounds. She, it's almost I mean, like watching Alan Iverson taking on, you know, the 2001 <laughs> Lakers. I mean, he's not that he's- much bigger. Well, phys- no. I know, but physically, it's not. It's not like she's this towering whatever. She's just this little. Just no, she's not Grace Jones. Spitfire! It's unbelievable. Right. Anything to add on that van before we move on? Um, I mean, for me, the most rewatchable scene, me, for me, period. Is oh no, no, I, did, I, I'm going through. I just didn't know if you had any Robin Givens. Oh no, um, I mean, listen, uh, you guys want me to get weird about it? The yeah. The fact that the 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 reality is that. Anytime she's on screen, she sizzles. And I, I actually, you said something earlier. Robin Givens' sons Halle Berry in this movie. Mm. Now, it, it's, 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 it's. I had that partly, in unanswerable questions later, but yeah, we can talk about it now. 
it's partly done by design. I mean, I watched the uh, in rewatching it. There's the scene where they uh, where they're having the Lady Eloise party, and Robin Givens walks up looking like she's about to hit the red carpet at the Academy Awards, and literally Halle Berry is wearing a sparkly black muumu <laughs> that shows that 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 shows not one scintilla of her shape, which is a which is a a, a, a her silhouette is movie star all time famous. They really worked to make sure that Halle Berry wasn't coming off, but they achieved their goal. Robin Givens, even at the end of the movie, where, where, where Halle Berry has gone Cruella DeVille and she is all hot and wearing form fit, it's still, I'm still thinking, damn, could I have got out of that bed with Robin Givens and gone back to this? I don't think I could have. I, don't I was texting you guys last. <laughs> I was texting you the screenshot of Eddie about to leave Robin Givens' bed. And I'm like, no way, no way, no oh, man. You did. No, it you never did. happens. It's you never did. happening ever. Nobody's getting out of her bed. Yeah, and so and and so like I think that in and of itself, because Halle Berry, like 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 you said, might be she top one percent finest women of all time. Just God bless her. But Robin Givens, she she pulls it off. She well, they go toe to toe. One scene after the, she starts dating Eddie Murphy, she's got the hat on, mm-hmm. and they're they're yeah. showing her the new Strands J commercial, and Robin Givens is kind of realizing their thing, and Hallie's kind of bringing it. She's got the hat, and that's when that's when she lay that that's when she starts making her MVP case in that yeah. scene. She's looking great. Uh, that little battle though is a fun one, and it's a good. It's a good argument too. It's well, it's, but the thing that I love about Halle Berry in this movie, though, is that she goes in the opposite direction, though. Like it's not, you know, there's a version of this movie where she is not encouraged to have a personality. She's just encouraged to be like mousy and sweet, right? Yeah. But Halle Berry is funny in this movie. She yeah. made me laugh like four times. And it was it was stuff that I don't even think is in the script. I think it's like Halle Berry just being like, "Well, if these panties come my way, I am making them go away." And <laughs> she just she her line deliveries are funny. I mean, Halle Berry, as much as I love her, she is not one of the she's she's not been given a lot of opportunities to be funny. But when she takes them, I'm th- the movies are never good. But she's really funny in Baps. She is. Really good in Jungle Fever as Samuel L. Jackson's really good. Uh, girlfriend. Really um, good in that movie. If you let her be funny and like not have to be Halle Berry, she's fantastic. And well, she's not Halle Berry yet in this movie, so she gets to be funny without the baggage of having to also be beautiful Halle Berry. It's in, she's so funny in this movie. In the research, it 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 they were saying she had like a lot of trouble keeping a straight face during like every John Witherspoon (laughs) moment. And so I read the research before I watched it again. And when you watch her in that movie, it's hilarious. If you just, cause it's hard not to look at John Witherspoon in that scene. Cause he's just swallowing up the entire movie, but she's like, just like looking down eating, but you can see like she's about to break (laughs) for three minutes. Like she can't even look at him cause she knows she's going to ruin the scene. Uh, I agree with you. I always thought there was a funny side to her and, uh, it's ironic that Monsters Ball became the movie that pushed over the top, which is probably a top seven most depressing movie yeah. of all time. Yeah. I, her, her what, Razzies, what, are the other, what are the other six? I don't know. There's, I, never, I, I, like, 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 there, there, there's no such thing as a movie. Like, I'm watching this shit. I'm like, yo, the next time, rather than go see Monsters Ball, I'll just pay $15 for someone to kick me in my nuts over and over and over and over again. <laughs> like, I've never seen anything like that movie before in my life. And I cannot, I went to see it for only one reason. But like, I, like, I, I can't, I can't believe that's easily the most depressing movie of all time. Make me feel good. Grams is up there. Make I can me take feel you good. to Europe. You, we can, we can go to Europe. I can, I can, it can be top. But <laughs> Irreversible. <laughs> or to go to yeah, I, it can be top. Uh, right. uh, next rewatchable scene. Hallie cheers up Eddie Murphy by bringing him to the art class. And then they oh, hang great. afterwards and they go to the Strong J thing. And we get the old guy trying to figure out if it's Grace Jones's nipple or not. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's got to be a nipple because I'm drooling. Um, Eddie in the art class is just like classic old school 80s Eddie with that little girl yeah. next to him. And she's doing the thing and he's imitating her. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, it's so fucking likable. I just love that part. Uh, next one. 
Look, I'm not splitting up the John Witherspoon scenes. I'm just lumping them all together into the John Witherspoon section of this movie, which includes the mushroom suit and Eddie's reaction to it. Uh, Marcus, I heard you're pussy whipped. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> reacting, they would go, don't be pussy whipped. Whip that pussy! And doing right. this whole thing on that. Uh, the bathroom scene. Oh, yeah. The parents coming out of the it's, bathroom. It's... The beat and then him hugging David Alan Greer, just all incredible. Uh, I, I'm just gonna to spoiler alert. This is my favorite part of the movie. I I just love every single ounce of this. I love every second of it. Uh, apparently they improvised just about all of it, and hmm. even to the point when his suit, they didn't know he was gonna wear that suit with her spoon. Uh, Eddie was really bullish on having him, and then Reginald Hudlin said. Those guys came up with just about everything on the spot. And he said he compared it to Miles Davis and John Coltrane. You have the funniest mm. <laughs> people in the world. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. if there was a day where it was Eddie and David and Martin, David and Martin would stand together. They would just be doing something funny. The whole crew gathering around them. They just wanted to eavesdrop. And then when John Witherspoon and B.B. Drake joined the group, it was literally too much funny. It was a completely unbearable amount of funny. Yeah. It sounds yep. amazing. Well, this is the weird thing about this movie, though. And this is why I'm shocked watching it now how unpolished it is. But it all feels, the thing that's sort of glorious about it is the thing that sort of keeps it from being a great movie movie and the thing that, like, makes it, like, outrageously watchable until the end of time, which is that Reginald Hudlund made a choice to keep just the best takes of whatever happened and not the ones that made the movie cohere, right? Yeah. Because here's a version of this movie. This movie does not need that John Witherspoon sequence. It well, does I, not wait, I have need a newsflash for you. Eddie demanded they add it to it. After, right. Like, this is basically shoehorned in because Eddie's yep. like, we got to get John Witherspoon in here. And it makes sense. Yes. But the movie doesn't need it. You don't no. need this, this movie. That scene does nothing. But it's one of those, it's a pleasurable sequence that I actually like about a certain kind of movie that can handle it. Um, but the movie was made in a style that can make it so that if you've got Grace Jones doing what Grace Jones is doing in this movie, and you got Eartha Kitt doing what Eartha Kitt is doing in this movie, then why not just throw in the John Witherspoon, B.B. Drake yes. scene? Because you've got all this other crazy shit happening. Why not have this? What's one more, what's one more six minute scene of just utter bring, I couldn't even, when I saw this movie, I couldn't hear what was being said on at least three different occasions because the audience was like rolling around on the floor of the movie theater. I'll never forget it. I'm like, you guys, we can't hear. <laughs> and they didn't right, leave space for people to like crack up. It was, it just was a wild movie going experience. That scene I'm killed the movie. Like, I'll be honest with you. I disagree with you guys. Oh. I think the scene, I'll be honest oh, no. with you. I, I, first of all, I love, <laughs> I love the scene. I think it's, it's the, uh, it's, it's my favorite, uh, it's my favorite scene in the movie. And it's like, even when we lost John, like I posted and said, like, this is when I realized the genius of John Witherspoon. Tell you why I, I think the scene works in the movie. Like a lot of things happen to Marcus Graham in the film, right? A mm -hmm. lot of things happen to him. Like he loses things, he gains things, right? And at the end, What's going to even like in the way everything is it, it's boomerang, but there are a lot of parallels in the movie. So like Robin Givens overwhelms him with sensuality and sexuality and beauty and strength and confidence. And then Halle Berry overwhelms him with heart. Right. He's down. So she takes him to go see some children and stuff like that. Right. It's a completely different way of getting someone to be enamored with you. Um, and we you know, the, the what wins in the end, like in this particular situation, his relationship with his homies is something else. At the beginning of this film, they worship him, right? They say penthouse form stuff doesn't happen to anyone except for Marcus. Like everything is about worshiping Marcus. Marcus comes back down to earth to where his version of himself ends up hurting one of his boys. It hurts his friend that is the most vulnerable of the three because he likes this girl. Now this guy that Marcus Graham uh, this this dude that he's sort of deified in a way, it's it finally impinging on to one of his friendships. In the scene with him and his dad, 
you see why David Allen Greer's character is so vulnerable. You see why he's so open hearted and why he's so why he doesn't assert himself. You see that any room he's always been in in his life, his father his and his father, mother yeah. Yeah. have just sucked the oxygen out of the room. So whereas anybody else has had to sort of like, you know, Marcus has had to find out ways to assert himself in all of these situations to get what he want. David Allen Greer's character has had to find out a way to cope with different things, right? And so in the time when he and Marcus are having this beef, what he was really kind of asking his homeboy to do was to protect him a little bit because he thought that that's why they were friends. So when he goes, you can have all the girls, like why not just this girl? He's asking for something from his man that he really hasn't gotten a lot of other places in his life. And even in that hug, that hug at the end of that scene where they hug it up, it's like, dog, I got, I'm with you, I got you. But he doesn't even know that that's going to be betrayed in a little bit. So, and like with me, kind of like having that same relationship with my dad, my dad's a big character and stuff like that. Like I related to that. I remember thinking, damn, you know, like being at a, at a table where people are carrying on and you feel unseen and your pops is the star, your pops is fucking in your homeboy's bathroom. And you like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I, I always watch that and it was funny, but also I thought it was actually great writing because it told the story of kind of why David Allen Greer's character looks at life the way he looks at life. That's a solid case. I, That's I really felt good. like it was shoehorned in, but I, I think you're right. Well, it's the, the, problem, it's the, the reason, background we need for David Allen Greer's character to be so upset later, other than just that they're friends. But if I can just be a studio executive for one second. <laughs> okay. I never thought I'd ask, but I'm I'm wearing this mustache. I feel like I'm entitled to to be some you know, studio executive. I feel like you could probably have done that without John Witherspoon. I feel like there's there's probably a way that you can do that in like one minute that doesn't need any of that stuff. Now, I'm not saying you have to make it go because if I'm the studio executive and you bring me that scene, I'm going to be really, it's going to be impossible for me to cut it because I know what it'll do in a movie theater. But... Well, you know what, Wesley? We that could was probably great, do Chris that was perfect. We could probably do Christmas without Christmas. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know where we stop <laughs> with things you want to take away from us. Like the John Witherspoon seed. <laughs> uh, two more rewatchable seeds. The pool game. When mm. there are the three of them are playing and Martin goes to get beers. And then Eddie asks about uh, Halle Berry and why are you asking? And then there's that long pause. Is it why are you asking? And that, yeah, all yeah. of that stuff. Eddie's performance is really good in that scene. Like he won't look at him. The he's embarrassed. Like it, it's just, I, I think it's really authentic. And I thought it was well done. And then, this is the first movie where I realized what a good actor he is. Yes, yeah. he's so good in this movie. Just, just his presence. He is present for every person with Witherspoon and the jacket. Yeah. He is just like, well, first of all, he's in awe of John Witherspoon, and you can see that a little bit, but he also is just like, he is letting John Witherspoon happen. And I don't know if it's Eddie thinking, they might not use this scene, so I'm going to let John just do John. Or, but, but he's so reactively present with John. He's not just like standing there letting John Witherspoon like, like dunk on him. He is very much an active part. Like so he's signaling in some way to John Witherspoon to just keep going. Like whatever, the, whatever is happening right now, just, just take it to fruition. I'm, I'm here. Well, this, I'm here. This is something you said during the Beverly Hills cop pod that his ability to bring out whatever the best qualities are of one other person in the scene and connect he, with people was his best skill yeah. as an actor. He is so secretly generous. He really is. I mean, this is why Robin Givens is so good in this movie. It's why, you know, I mean, even Tisha Campbell, who had many opportunities to do a version of what she did in this movie on Martin when that show starts. She, Layla Rashawn, I mean, every scene, every person he's got a scene with, oh my God, that wonderful lab doctor, the technician who is yeah. like appalled by Stranger and the direction they want to take the... <laughs> that little actor, I don't remember what that guy's name is. He is 
he is just delightful with Eddie Murphy. And that is a thing that happens, I think, only if you feel comfortable enough to, to, to let somebody else do the work they need to do in well, a scene. Well, by the way, that was SNL training, right? Like, mm-hmm, ultimately, mm-hmm. the best yeah, SNL cast true. members, Will Ferrell, whoever, those are the guys who connect with the other thing. Yvette, you had one thing to say on this, man? No, I was just saying, no, I agree. Like, I think... Uh, it's funny you guys mentioned Beverly Hills Cop. When I, when I watch Beverly Hills Cop, I almost think I always I always think about how much I love Taggart and Rosewood. Mm-hmm, like I mm-hmm, love yeah. like I like like I like the reason the real reason why the movie is so dope is because I love Eddie. Of course, I love Axel, but I love the little like relationship between Taggart and Rosewood and Axel Foley, and that's because Eddie kind of knows how to do that. But like this is the first movie where I realize because he's this is also the first movie where he's not jumping off of the screen almost. I mean, Golden Child, he's a little bit more muted too. But like- That's really, embarrassment, really, fan. That's- yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. But he, <laughs> he, he really is, uh, he really is, it's, it's very solid, like really good. And we would see, obviously he would go on to like do great things um, in serious roles. The last scene I have for rewatchable is the three buddies making up on the roof. Mm. Um, mm, yeah. It's really- all of this is just really good. And then Martin Lawrence coming in, coming in late, telling them to make up, not realizing they already had the hug. No, we already did that. And he said, no, man, what big motherfucking hug, man. And, uh, and then it goes right into the PM Dawn song and the Empire State Building, the lights turning off. Like, I, honestly, it's really good movie making. Uh, I think in general, this is a really well-crafted, well-polished movie, but that scene's just good. It's one of those scenes where you can see in your head, you can see him on the roof. You can see the building behind them. And, you know, ultimately, this is a movie about these three guys. I think it's Mm -hmm. all this Mm -hmm. other shit's going on, but it's really a movie about the three guys and their friendship. And then it's going on all these tangents, but that's what I would have liked to have seen. I mean, to that to that point, Bill, I feel like the two and a half hour version of this movie, or at least like the two hour and 10 minute version of this movie where you where where like Martin Lawrence's life becomes more like they figure out a way to build some relationship for him into this plot. And it becomes more of a, like the farce, the movie is also a farce, right? And the degree to which it is willing to, to, to let the farce take over so much of it, which it basically does until the end. Um, I would have liked to have seen Martin Lawrence with a bigger stake in in the degree to which this movie is a farce. Although all of his race stuff is so outlandish that it is basically an it is another his relationship is basically with racism. That's yeah. his girlfriend. True. And and you know, he doesn't he is completely dogged by that. Um hey. in his in his racial theories, which which and when I was in high school, like he was the most powerful person in the movie. Because every time he said something, it was like, oh my God, I never thought about that. Yo. I never thought about it that way. Yo, I like rewatching it, I just can't like I, I can't tell you how many times I've been watching that movie and sitting down with one of my cousins or something like that and go, he right though. Yep. Spears. <laughs> and when they're like, 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 y'all keep saying that, y'all say that if y'all want. He right though. And then the scene where they're walking out of the the clothing store and then Eddie jumps, jumps at, the, at guy. the guy. Yeah. We did that for years. Yep. Like we like for like for years, we would just jump at somebody. It's just like we did that for years. Martin's kind of like the Alex Caruso of the movie. Like he like everybody likes to see him when he's in the game. Mm. Um uh and like and but when he's in there, he makes an impact, but he's not in it as much as you would think. It's like, but it's still though, I still contend that coming off of like house party, and this this was kind of like this movie was in a weird way, an initiation into Martin a little bit. Because I think, mm-hmm. it, had the oh, show yeah. started yet? Had the no. show started? No. It had, like, it had so in a weird, like, we knew Martin, but this was kind of like an initiation to him. It was a big, big, big part of his career. Big part. Same, same director. Uh, true or false, this movie was supposed to originally end with them on the roof. Ooh. Ooh. It feels like an ending. That does feel like an ending. They added all the other stuff. Yep, it feels like an ending. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Okay. Totally the different. Roof film, was, by the the way. roof was the ending, and um, 
and I don't know whether they added it after they finished the script or after they had the original cut, but one of Reginald Hudlin's friends was like, he's got to, you can't end it that way. Uh, Marcus has to make a choice. And so they added the, they, yeah, they this is what I'm saying it. about the sort of, about the way this movie does not feel like it, it was, it was, it's one of those editing room movies. It just does not feel like a thing that came off the page. It We're going like to talk about that when we do okay. what stage the worst. Uh, okay. I, for most rewatch, I have Witherspoon. You guys, Van has Witherspoon. Yeah. I what do you have, sure. Wesley? I have, I mean, we have not talked about my complicated feelings about that scene, though. Um, I feel like it pre, it like, there's a long history of that scene in black theater. Um, there's also a, like a post history of that scene in Tyler Perry's black theater. Um, that is a scene out of black theater, just straight up. Mm-hmm. And it, it just brings with it all this baggage that I think for old people in the audience, for a certain kind of old people, like the Huxtable kind of old person in the audience for this movie, like, it's like, well, why do we need to bring, why do we need, why do we need this in here? And the, the, the idea that you would have that, that those two people, the part of the farce of having this sort of, this black culture convergence where you'd have these Southern black people bringing chitlins into into a bougie black person's house that just that is that is a bougie black person's worst nightmare is to have to clean some chitlins in in their like hundred thousand dollar kitchen and the idea that Halle Berry would be one of the Halle Berry who we don't know but this light skinned black lady would be <laughs> this beautiful light skinned black lady would also be like asked to deal with 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 chitlins is also supposed to be funny and the movie knows that it just is like a, it's a it's a, if you It's a strange scene from the standpoint of a combination of black culture and black snobbery. Um, So it's not, so it's not your pick. (laughs) It's extremely, uh, I don't know. know. You don't have a most rewatchable scene. Oh, anything with, uh, Oh, the, the boardroom meet the, the first time that Grace Jones goes to the boardroom and tries to name all the comes up with a name for the perfume. Okay. Um, Steel Vagina is one of the funniest things. <laughs> I mean, I was in tears. I was in tears. Steel Vagina. It's fantastic. What's age the best? Um, Jeffrey Holder as the horny ad creative, mm. Nasty <laughs> Nelson. <laughs> the first time we see him, he's like, here's my ad for the Kissable, Kissable, Kissable campaign. Spot. And models and are just floor. giving blowjobs to bananas. The bananas. <laughs> and he's so the cherries. Delighted. The cherries. That guy's you know great. I- um, what, I, I, what I love about that scene is that he's so dejected when Eddie says, <laughs> you know, we can't do blowjobs on bananas. Like after the yeah, Cosby he's stunned. Show. He's stunned. Like, 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 yeah, he's, he's like, he's so upset. What do you Don't mean? be upset. <laughs> what do you mean? I can't have a model licking between the cherry. I can't do cunnilingus on fruit. Like in prime time. What do you mean? It's, I love that part of it. Uh, <laughs> another what's age the best. This movie created Martin. So... Mm. On the set, Reginald Hudlin, he was always raving about Tisha Campbell, Martin Lawrence, and Murphy said to Hudlin, you should do a film with the two of them. And Lawrence was working on his TV pilot at the time, overheard them talking and said, I'll just get her to be my girlfriend in the show. And that's how she ended up on Martin. Wow. So the yeah. story goes. It sounds wow. a little cute and perfect, but I'm not saying it sounds cute. I'm saying he saw her and he wanted her to be the girlfriend on the show. File this away for later. That ended up rearing its ugly head. Yeah, it also shows up at what's age the worst. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh another what's age the best. Hammer time and the Twizza are just I just yeah. feel like if you say those things to Anybody who likes this movie, they'll know immediately. The fucking Twizza kills me. Uh, The Eddie orgasm scene, the second time she's riding him and he has the orgasm with uh, his feet and she starts kissing his neck. He's "Ah, ah!" He's doing that whole thing and she's kissing the neck. It's so fucking funny. We mentioned Lady Eloise's butler. Strange's helicopter entrance is just like Uh. a good movie scene. I just really enjoy it. She comes out, Mm -hmm. the trunk breaks out of it. It's really well filmed. Um, I mentioned how oh I the, the decision for Marcus and Angela to end up together was a last minute rewrite rewrite. Uh Halle Berry, just her in this movie, almost a perfect rom-com character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. 
I like if you're like, hey, come up with some nitpicks for this character. We need some notes. How do we make her better? I'm like, you're good. I have no notes. You just if, go. If there if there was any justice in the world, she'd have become Meg Ryan right after this movie came out. Like if there she, was any if there were any if there was any justice in the world, when you talk about someone with that level of she's beautiful, but she can vacillate from beautiful to cute and do the whole thing. I couldn't agree with you guys more. She really made the most. She was like, in many ways, it's her most complete performance. Like she like, she kind of, she stole mm -hmm. every scene she was in. And she was kind of just like, cause there natural. are times, natural. There were, exactly. There were times in her career, you know, losing Isaiah, uh, losing Isaiah moments where she was, you know, forcing it. But in this film, it's everything about Halle Berry that kind of makes you believe that she was going to be a movie star that she actually, actually became. More would say the best. The role reversal stuff, even though it's a cliched rom-com thing, I think it's done really well. It's really smart. And even the sex scenes where it looks almost like she's Robin Gibbons is fucking Eddie. The way right. they film yeah. it, where yeah. she's on yeah. top. And yeah. it's not like she's yeah. riding yeah. him like Sharon Stone. It's like I she's really kind of fucking that. him. Yeah, I really yeah. noticed and, that. And he's like the, I, it's just really smart. I'm I like not how saying they do anything. It. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This movie is telling on on you, Eddie. Um, Strange commercial number one, which had Strange, it stinks so good uh, when it goes wrong. When Eddie lets Jeffrey Holder's character just do his own commercial, and, and all fucking hell breaks the, loose, she passes right. the perfume bottle out of her. Out of her. The, the the best part about that scene to me is just how horrified, horrified Eartha Kid is. Yeah. Like just how she is beyond, she is yeah. so offended. She, I laugh every time, man. It's great. It's, uh, yeah. it's a nipple because I'm drooling. Another would say the right. best. Marcus breaking down Star Trek as they're falling half asleep and mm. talking about how Spock's last name was Spock Jenkins. So to no surprise, he ad libbed that whole thing. But you know, you're talking '92. There wasn't a lot of content like this in movies. I, I think this was one reason, like, why Tarantino's movies took off because you would have these weird moments in the Tarantino movies yep. where they talk about what was Spock's last name and shit like that. Now it's like in the internet era, we've 20 plus years of people having these arguments, but in 92, just to see somebody talk about Star Trek for two minutes was fucking fun. You know, yeah. and you'd be like, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's have some captain Kirk talk. Um, another would say the best when Hallie actually dumps Marcus. And she does the, you know what the bad thing about having a heart is, Marcus? Get broken by people like you. The slap apparently was real. That's why oh, yeah. it makes that sound. Like, she really hits him. Oh, yeah. And, Love uh, should have brought your ass home last night. It's great. Yep. Which becomes the song. Which and then, the song. Uh, I like Eddie's clothes in this movie. Never wears oh, a tie. Good. No tie. Not one tie the whole time. Fantastic clothes. Fantastic. All stuff he, that I think would work now. And then uh yeah, he is ridiculously sharp in this film. Yes. The Even like his little half zip sweaters, uh, yeah. all that shit's looking great. Only Harlem Knights can 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 compete with Eddie Murphy's sharpness here. Only Harlem Knights. And then the last thing for sharpness. me is the uh the whole getting whipped, having your heart broken, and then regaining your mojo is such like an identifiable real life theme that you don't see pulled off correctly in movies enough. They do a nice job with this. Like even when Robin Gibbons says to him later in the movie, like, oh, Marcus, you kind of got it going again. You, you know, and <laughs> just the whole lost <laughs> regained mojo thing. I totally identifiable. We've yeah. all had been in relationships or something where you, you know, you, you get, you took a haymaker, you, you, your confidence gets shook and you got to work through it. And then you, you're kind of back. And I think they did a good job with that. In this, any There's other? What's so aged the best? Things like that. Uh, what's aged the best? Um, because I, think I like we all hit a lot yours. Okay. I like all you got it. You got it all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what would you go with if you had to do a number one pick? I would say for me, Halle Berry. You say Halle Berry aged has the aged best? the best for me. Her performance in this movie, because yeah. I, I oh, agree yeah, with what I'd you said, Van. Where it's like. Why wasn't she Meg Ryan? Like, I think that's a legitimate question to ask when you watch this in 2000. Yeah, I, I'd say, I'd say, that, like, because even when I go back, because the knock on Halle Berry for a long time was that beautiful face, only slightly competent actress, you know? If you look back on it now, maybe unfair, 
but that's not maybe- true. It's just not. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's not right. fair. I guess is maybe not the fair way to put it. Yeah, and so when you look at this, she is like oozing with charisma and star power. It's almost like can a, I just? Like a, oh, go ahead. Sorry, man. No, I'm saying it's like like a like when you watch Thelma and Louise. And the, that 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 one guy with his shirt off is only in the movie for a little bit, but you go, ah, kid's got something. He's just like the 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 screen loves him. He's 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 gliding in and out of this situation. She kind of has that same thing, but it she's got a bigger role, obviously. But it kind of it she became a thing, but to be a real thing, it took Hollywood a little while to kind of catch up to Halle Berry. But and it didn't even catch up then. I mean, she won the Oscar and. She hasn't done anything remotely as interesting as Monsters Ball since she won the Oscar, right? And I will say this is, I don't want to go into the whole history of of America in making this point, but I think there's a really important thing to think about when you think about when a black actor has a great moment in a movie. And when the schools desegregated in 1954, they, you know, this is not a sort of a documented thing, but, you know, they dis- they desegregated wrongly, essentially. And they put the onus on the desegregation on the kids, not on the teachers. It wasn't the teacher's job to segregate the schools. It was the kid's job. And what do kids know about segregation, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, the black teachers sued the state of of, of Kansas to basically be put back in the schools, to like, to have a fairer shot to teach black children once the black schools had been dismantled and the black kids had been sort of sent into these integrated environments to learn. And so suddenly you had all these black teachers with no jobs. In addition to it ruining a whole major portion of black education in this country, it also created this idea that black people had nothing to offer other black people. And this is a very long way of saying A lot of the best things I think black actors have done have been under the aegis of black producers and black directors with black writers and other black Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's not that you can't be good in a movie made by a white person. I just think you might be directed to do different things in a movie directed by another black person if you're a black actor. Mm -hmm. And all of Halle Berry's best work has been, I think, with people, with black directors. I think, you know, I'm thinking about like uh, Regina Hall and Kevin uh, and Kevin Hart in that re- remake of About Last Night. <laughs> that was a movie, it's a better movie than you think it is. And I Regina dig that Hall, movie, I, bro, I dig that movie, bro. Regina like, Hall love- and Kevin Hart are so good in that movie and it doesn't happen right. under different, I just think it, 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 there's something about black people working with black people that it's it's rare enough to be special mm-hmm. and special enough to be comforting to, to to the black artists when they're thinking about when they're when they're just trying to practice their craft without the pressures of impressing white people. Don um, Cheadle and Devil in a Blue Dress, like I like mean, fan- great example, fant- yeah. fantastic performances that like for some reason slip through and people just you know you sit down and you 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 I mean obviously Don Cheadle is a fucking badass, but like. It's just like when we talk about the great performances in the 90s, there's one that people never talk about. Quickly on Halle Berry. I don't want to belabor this too long. This was her 1991. She made an appearance on A Different World. Oh, yeah. Mm. Jungle Fever. Strictly Business. The Last Boy Scout. Oh, boy. Oh! Busy. Not Landing. Not, not done. Six episode <laughs> arc on Not Landing. Ooh, All those yes. things happen. Yes. Bo- Boomerang in 92. And then people are like, Halle Berry's a thing. This is her next slew of movies. Fatherhood. Don't remember that one. The Flintstones, which was supposed to be a thing. Oh, ended yeah. Up not she being was, a thing. She was Sharon Stone, wasn't she? Uh-huh. Wasn't that her character's name? Mm-hmm. Uh, Losing Isaiah, which was supposed to be a big prestige Oscar movie and just wasn't good. Executive Decision, big action mm. movie. They were, um, it was, it was just wasn't happening. Wasn't happening. Uh, the Rich Man's Wife, which oh, was another yeah. one supposed to be a big yeah. movie, didn't happen. Race the Sun, I don't know what that was. Oh, Bat- it was about the, she was a, she was a teacher of kids in Hawaii or something like that, mm-hmm. and they were mm-hmm. building like a race cars or something. Baps, mm-hmm. she I don't was remember good in that, that one. 
Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, what the fuck's going on? She's in Bullworth. She, why do fools fall in love? And it wasn't until Dorothy Dandridge in 1999, she's good yep. in that. And people are like, oh, Halle Berry. She won an Emmy for that, I think. She wins an Emmy. And yeah. then there's this really fun twist where it goes X-Men 2000. She breaks him out in Swordfish in 2001. Swordfish. That was a big moment. And that it, was a national. That was a national event, you guys. That I mean, I need to tell you two that. Like, it, it was. It was the. I, it was I a drove huge 30, career I drove move. 30, drew, drove thirty miles for it. Yeah, it like, was, I was in college in Ruston. I drove to Monroe, to the theater there to see it. So I have wow. that movie, and then. Jacko and I went and saw the Heaven's Prisoners with Terry Hatcher. Same reason. It's like she's. Oh, I remember oh, Terry okay. Hatcher. I'll go. Yes. 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 That's yes. a joint. Whoa. Whoa. There's a topless <laughs> Terry Hatcher scene. I'm going. She was so, thinking a lot in that joint. Yeah. Swordfish 2001 and then Monsters Ball 2001. So it happens. Right I feel there, like yeah. she did have swings. They were just the wrong swings in a lot of ways. But people did but, like her and think she was an important. Oh no, actress. she was. A, she no, no. I'm not saying that. I don't mean to say that she wasn't working. I'm saying. For some reason, whatever was supposed Wasn't to happen, it, yeah. it didn't happen. Mm -mm. Not in the way mm -mm. to elevate her. Like it, 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 it didn't happen for a long time after that. Also, none of those parts were boomerang parts. No, none of those parts required her to just sort of be in a movie. Like, right? She was either a girlfriend or a body or you know, in some contrived action thing that wasn't even her movie. It was somebody else's. Like, think it about, just, could so, in Pulp Fiction, could she have been Marcellus Wallace's girlfriend? Mm, hmm. Good question. I mean, I would have definitely, I mean, sure, why not? Maybe. But she was, she's missing a part like that in a really good movie yeah. where oh, she's not yeah. carrying it and she's in it and she's awesome and people go, whoa. But or even if she had been in Beautiful uh, Girls, <laughs> like in oh, the Uma Thurman part, some just, part where she just goes in and takes over a movie for 20 minutes and leaves. She didn't even have that. Mm. Anyway, no. uh, what's age Thank the worst? Thank you, racism. <laughs> what's age the worst other than Eddie not realizing Halle Berry was hot for 90 solid minutes of the movie? Um, hey, look, this is... I hate when they do this in movies, but Robin Givens really caring about this random 1992 Knicks game... Them oh, really going for the whole, oh, she's a big sports fan. She's kind of like a guy. She just wants to have a beer and watch the Knicks. It just feels kind of forced. I'm sorry. Uh, Marcus and his buddies all working out together on the same machines, on the rowing machines, the three yeah. of them doing. Nobody, does, no guy, three guys don't work out together. And if they do, I, I haven't met them yet. I thought that was <laughs> I call guys, the gym attendant. I always call the gym attendant. Yo. <laughs> We got a romantic comedy happening over here. I, right. I break it up. I need to use three one guys, of these machines. Three guys don't work out together. That, 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 <laughs> so that never happens? That doesn't happen. You don't think that? <laughs> okay. Um, three guys just working out, doing the same machines, going to this, going from the one to the other. Up, no what, way. What if, it was, what if they were lifting weights and getting pumped? Like, That's they fine. Out together. Right. <laughs> not, not doing a whole routine. Not um, three rowing machines. So I'm not going to say the entire shopping scene has aged the worst. Because I think it's an important scene in this movie in, in a lot of different ways. The part I don't like is when the racist store clerk just immediately goes into the, we don't keep cash in the store. It's so <laughs> abrupt. Like, they easily just could have edited that out and the whole rest of the scene works. It's so strange that he just immediately goes to that place. Like, they're going to, I don't know. I just wish they had cut that one line out. I like everything else in the scene. Bill, can I give you a transcript of all the racisms that I've, I've experienced? <laughs> like we're like say. they're just i wish there had been an editor to cut that scene out of my life okay <laughs> yeah. all right fair fair i mean i'm just saying like it as comedy it just it did make me laugh i was like oh well this is just now this is just a joke on on racist things that happen to people in stores and this guy is going to give us all of them this yeah. this is a really weird era of racist or judgmental store clerks because oh, yeah. pretty, pretty woman has the great one pretty where woman. they go into the pretty Same woman thing. and they just kind of they they just have no time for her. uh i i don't love tisha campbell in this movie i don't know if it's necessarily what's age the worst but no i, I agree it's kind of a one note part she's mm -hmm. in probably one scene too many and then uh yep. you know this is just a nerdy movie thing but there's a lot of like fade to black cuts in the last 45 minutes which i think Goes back to Wesley's point about this movie's a little disheveled and patched together 
and when you're doing these fade to black cuts, it's almost like, uh, well, add that scene, and then, uh, well, it doesn't fit with the other scenes. I uh, just did the fade to black cut again. It There's just feels one amateur -y. specifically. There's one specifically that is really bad. Like yeah. after, uh, after they're watching the commercial, I guess the the new commercial that he's made, um, and he's fixed everything, and they kind of just go to black, like. Like it, like that one. Even when I was a kid and knew nothing about editing or pacing of a movie, I was like, "That doesn't make any sense." Yeah, it's just like, lazy. You know I mean, that was really um, bad. Yeah, casting what ifs. We don't really have a lot for these, um, but we do have this. Hudlin. Oh, wait, I have a thing about what's age the worst. Oh, go. Oh, let's hear it. Um, you guys, we just watched a like two hour movie full of so much borderline sexual harassment. Like, if this movie oh, were happening now. <laughs> You couldn't make this movie now. True. Because I, I whole... just thought that was inherent. Yeah, yeah I didn't think I, I needed I was, to I was, say that. Actually, no, that's so weird. I just accepted that. Like, it, yeah. it's like, it's not even borderline. Number one, Martin Martin is jumping at people and stick, and then Lady Eloise is basically Kevin Spacey. Like, she, she, <laughs> I mean, like, she, like, she literally, She's the worst. Like so, it's like Kevin yeah, definitely. Spacey. She's Harvey Weinstein. Harvey I Weinstein. Mean, excuse me. Yeah. You could say this is a pre two movie. Yeah. Pre two. I mean, yes. <laughs> for sure. It's um, just wild. It's so rampant. Yeah, Every that was single the early nineties though. People. People. Yeah. That's how a lot of people met. Unfortunately, uh, casting what ifs. Hudlin wanted Halle Berry. She came in and did a reading. He was nervous. Murphy wouldn't like her. She did the screen test. Murphy said, that's it. There's no need to see the other actresses. Hmm. And they didn't audition hmm. the other actresses. Um, you're not going to believe this, but executives of Paramount Pictures were nervous about Robin Givens being cast. She was so disliked in the general public, but they fought for her and they got her. But they had Vanessa Williams as the backup for Jacqueline. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's a different movie, though. Yeah, it it's is. a different movie. Does it is. It, it, oh, but Vanessa you need the was basic so bad, instinct though. thing of it. I mean, what's crazy is basic instinct comes out the same year. You have the basic instinct, Catherine Tremell, Sharon Stone character, yeah. and you have this character in like a three month span who mm. are both one seeds in the uh, seductress pool. Uh, most of everything else said there were no casting what ifs. They knew kind of, they knew David Allen Gray was going to be at Aunt Martin, et cetera, et cetera. Best That Guy, a.k.a. the Joey Pants Award, mm. Jeffrey Holder. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if most people know that Jeffrey Holder is his name. So that's the guy, the uh, the creepy yeah. ad guy. Uh, no, the Vincent Hanna, Give Me All You Got Award for overacting. Give me all you got! Um, Grace Jones. Dials it up to a thousand. I don't know. No, I don't, I don't Listen, with it. Listen, I'm not saying I didn't love like, it, like, but she dials it, it up. It, uh, like, like I, I think she deserves... She should have got an Oscar nominee for the leg scene in the restaurant. I'm like, not arguing like, with you. I'm just like, saying like, she's but, she's but bringing it. But but you can't put Grace in the movie and not get Grace. You are you get you Grace see, when you see Grace. You know it's fucking ha time to have a good time, dog. Well, so you like get, I, I you like, get Grace, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's probably Grace Jones. It's it's yeah. Grace. The uh, new category since the last time you guys did the pod, the Brandy Booth Award for best performance by a pet. Um. This goes to Kirby, Kirby the Kirby the Invisible Dog. The invisible I'm dog. giving him Kirby. eight cheers out of ten. Kirby, <laughs> Kirby. Uh, so we never that was saw a great him, move. but yeah, that was. Good. I, I, I actually even love how he calls Kirby just for himself after Kirby. Yeah, Kirby, sir. After Kirby, sir. Already, the ruse is up, right? <laughs> so the Dion Waiters Award category for best heat check. Oh boy, is about as loaded as it's, we've ever had. Mm, <laughs> mm, Our mm, nominees mm, include. Mm. Chris Rock, mm. John Witherspoon, BB, mm. BB. What's her last name? BB. I'm blanking. Great. John uh, Witherspoon's wife, BB Jones. No, no, that's not. I have it, it just, somewhere. BB Drake. BB Drake. BB Drake. BB Drake. Drake. All right, Craig, edit this. Three, two, one. Uh, BB Drake, John Witherspoon's wife, Eartha Kitt. Um, Jeez. the. I don't know if that's a nipple, but I'm drooling, guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the little girl in the art class oh! who's in two scenes and steals both scenes. Just great. Mm -hmm. I think it's Witherspoon, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any. I mean, look, to be honest with you, Witherspoon's, it's got to be in the Dion Waiters Hall of Fame. 
like it, it like yeah it, it, it like he it's way up there you could make an argument that it's the most memorable scene of the entire movie and it really like it like to me when i would go back like, there were times when i would watch i would just be pull up that scene and watch it like it's it's by far by far to me like I, one of to the, me we've had the dan waiters award for 140 movies I could honestly be talked into calling this the John Witherspoon Award. I think it's the all-time Deanne <laughs> Waiters. It's the all-time heat check of any movie we've ever done where he's yes. in, in the movie for nine minutes. He, he puts up 29 points. He hits 10 threes. <laughs> he, he demolishes everybody. He swings the score. It's unbelievable. You'll be telling your grandkids about it. I just don't know if you can do better than this. He's in the movie for nine minutes. Right. Uh, I think so you got to keep it Dion Waiters just to like for Dion Waiters' sake. Well, I think but, the answer is to have a first. We were talking when we got to 150 rewatchables, having the rewatches for the uh, oh the first the mm. Hall of Fame, the first class of Hall of Famers, and I think that's probably the answer with the, with Dion Waiters is Witherspoon. Yeah, getting his yeah. just due as an all time right. Dion Waiters. So it's, anyway, he wins. That is, yeah, that's a no brainer. Re- the recasting couch where we could recast any part in this movie. I got to be honest. I love the casting in this movie. I wouldn't change anything. I'm sure Wesley has a nitpick though. Go ahead. Mm. I'm not going to nitpick, but here's a casting. What if slash, uh, well, just a casting. What if plus, uh, um, I watched this movie and I never thought about this before, but well, okay. So just think about all of the people in this movie. They really didn't, at that level, like everybody below Eddie Murphy, they didn't really miss anybody. There's nobody like where you're just like, well, they, I can't believe, I wonder if XYZ was, they got everybody. But I watched this movie and I actually think that Whitney Houston would have oh. killed in this movie. As, as the Robin Givens character. I don't know what she would have done, but I think she would, they, I mean, again, she would have been really comfortable in this environment. Mm-hmm. I think that she would have been like she could have been strong. She could, I mean, you could have challenged her to be something interesting. I don't know. I don't know. But I really think Whitney Houston, this movie just felt like it needed Whitney Houston. And I don't know why. It's funny. Number one, it's funny that she was way more strong than we thought she was strong yep, at that time. Yep. Like we didn't even know how much strong Jay she actually was. Like we didn't. <laughs> But it's weird that as as soon as you said that, like I saw her in it. Yeah, feel it now. It now feels like Whitney Houston is in the movie. She's not, but like yeah, it, 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 as soon as you said that, I'm like yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, just so don't I know guess who she, she could have played. Be. She could played Strong J, or she could have played uh, Lila Rashan's character, right? If you just yeah, but to she was the, she was one of the biggest stars in the world. Yeah, it's gonna you'd be have a lot to, to ask her to do that. You'd have to give her something else to do. The Bodyguard, I think, is that November, right? Or is it so basically, you you're giving her Halle Berry's part then, because I don't think she can be given. Uh, I, I don't think I don't she works wanna, there. I don't, don't want to mess with there. history like that. So we need a third character. We need a new character. Now this movie's got to be three hours. Martin's girlfriend. Martin's girlfriend. I was about to say, write somebody for Martin. Oh, that's interesting. It's like two right. scenes, and she's like a of a, a new like she wants to be a singer or something. They she's they a do a little bleed singer. over. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They go to see her sing and in, in the thing and don't blow this. <laughs> and she's Millie Jackson. Star. She's not winning. Right. She sings Millie Jackson songs. <laughs> That's great. That's a good call. Uh, Half Fast Internet Research. Eddie created the idea for the film, took it to Barry Blostein and David Sheffield, his guys from SNL who wrote a lot of his stuff with him. Eartha Kitt was the hardest person to cast for the film. She was offended by the character in the original script. So they had to uh, take some of the tasteless jokes out. I think she was offended by the old, I don't want to fuck that lady stuff. Mm. I, so they, I, when I watched it, when I watched it, I was surprised she did it. Yeah. I was, me too. Yeah, that yeah. is, I, I agree, Van. Well, yeah, I think too. it was worse. Um, there was an extra scene involving Strange taking off her chain metal dress, ring off the metal detectors, walking through them naked, shot at Newark Airport. They decided it didn't work. They used it in the perfume commercial. That's why she's naked in the perfume commercial. Mm. Mm. Grace um, Jones, man. Wesley, you only have 20 seconds to react to this, but Hudlin said <laughs> that um, 
Jules and Jim was an influence on the story arc between the characters, Angela, Gerard, and Marcus. <laughs> what? <laughs> it feels like a heat check by Reginald Hudlin. I, I don't know. <laughs> what? Uh, what? He said, uh, he said, I saw it when I was a kid, that awkward, awkward feeling of two guys. One has a better time with girls than the other. They fall in with the same woman. I remember the agony of watching the emotional stakes of that picture. So there you go. If you ever wonder if Jules and Jim affected Boomerang. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Totally different ending from Jules and Jim. Yeah. And then uh, Leela Rashan apparently had beautiful feet. Just huh. for the record, they had to ugly her feet up, put some makeup and some fake Hammer Time stuff on it. One of the all-time great scream beauties, Leela Rashan. Yes. Beautiful woman. Agree. Apex Mountain. Robin Givens. For sure. Mm-hmm. Has to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. David About Alan Greer, that. I think, has to be. He's on In Living Color at the same time. And I think he's had a good career, but this is, I think, he's in this movie and he's on a hit TV show at the same time. He's really good in this movie, though. I would never have been able to appreciate, like, what he's bringing to this film and, like, watching it as a grown man who is paying attention in a different way. He's so wonderful in every scene he has. He's, he's present a in a different actor. way than Eddie Murphy is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a, such a fantastic performer. Like, I, you, you wonder, and he went on to do some things like Jumanji and stuff, like, but you wonder, like, why? We keep asking this question, but like, yeah, he's so good in this and he's so real and so human, yet still so funny. It's like a level you didn't think he's just great. And you just wonder why he never, it, it was never recreated. You know, he's still having a great career, but why it was never recreated on screen to this level again. It's funny because I, I meant to put this in what Sage the best because I'm the same way. I love him in this movie. I think he's really, really good and just so fucking likable. And I just think he's likable in general. Like he's a legendary talk show guest. Like, right? Like if Kimmel knows, like, oh, we need somebody two Thursdays from now, let's get Dag. He'll he'll kill. Mm-hmm. Um it's funny that all the seeds that you see of him in this movie and the same for Martin Lawrence, but then Martin Lawrence propels it into like four things, right? He's got his TV show. He's got bad boys. Like it just kind of keeps going and you can see all the seeds of it in this movie, but you can also see the seeds with Dag. And it's like, I, I don't, I don't know why it didn't happen other than all the reasons we've already discussed. He's so fucking likable. Yeah. yeah. He just, I, don't get I think that he, he's has the misfortune of having gone first in a lot of places. Like, he had Key and Peele's show before Key and Peele yeah, had their show, right? And he he's just unlucky. Like he's there's either somebody more outrageously funny than he is, or he comes after Chappelle and nobody was really ready for like what I could only describe as like middle class black comedy. Um, I think that, you know, he isn't a star person. And he's a character actor if he's a character, if he's an actor, you know, if he considers himself like a serious actor. No, he's a, he's a tweener because he right. can't like be the lead guy on the poster, but he's too good to be like, you know, the buddy. Right. But, but he's overqualified though, he, to be the buddy. He he does something that a lot of actors don't do, which he's he adds to every single production yes. that he's in. Yes. Yeah. Every, like yep. every single like a lot of actors. Cannot say that. Some of them was on these screens taking up space. But he adds to every scene. He's just an incredibly talented guy. Like, he really is, man. And, and, I, and, I rare, he's, had a, and he's had a great career, by the way. He's had a great career. I rarely say stuff like this because it's obnoxious. But he's a fucking awesome guy. Because he's in that whole Kimball universe. Mm. And he's exactly like he is, like you would think he is, to hang out with. Like, he's just, like, really a great guy. I really like him. Um Picking nits, we mentioned a lot of the picking nits. Here, here's the only one that really bugs me. Angela really moves in fast with Marcus. Like they they're watching Star <laughs> Trek and hooking up. And next thing you know, like all her stuff's there. Mm-hmm. Like yep. I it's abrupt. And I, I don't know this movie from a concept of time, because at some point then they break up and they say how four months has passed. And she has this new job that already has a new perfume out. And Marcus yeah, doesn't I, have a job anymore, but that's only four months. But then you figure she moves in in five seconds, but then there's a whole year leading up to that. And I don't know again, how many years this movie is supposed to cover, but it, you would think it's at least three. 
There is a three hour cut of this movie. I'm telling you. Hmm. There's well, a three hour for it. I think it, I think I it mean, went, I'm in it. It flows by at the two hours it's at now. Unlike this podcast, uh, <laughs> best quote, <laughs> best quote. I'm going with love should have brought your home last brother. Let me start again. Best quote. Uh, I'm going with love should have brought your ass home last night only because it, then it becomes a song. It's when you yeah. have the combo of, it's always good when they work the title into the movie, like I say anything that. is, which we're doing for this week. They work the title in the movie. This, they work a line that becomes a, a memorable song into the yep. movie, which I, I think high degree of difficulty for that. You're wrong, um, by the way. Which one? The quote, of the, the quote, of the, you're wrong. The quote well, of the give movie it to is, me. Okay, it, it's easily, uh, don't get pussy whipped. Whip that pussy. <laughs> well, we covered that one. Though. We said that one already. <laughs> so that's the quote of the movie. Do you think anyone it, ever no, used that it. as a senior yearbook quote or no? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say I've got I, I the thing the line that really stuck in my brain though all these years is I'm giving you my Mac Daddy vibes here. Right. <laughs> I, I'm giving it like check it, yo, check right. it. He Yo, was really in Eddie Murphy getting to speak 90s slang. It just was like, he seemed so thrilled to be able to connect to the way like people seven years younger than he was were talking. Mm -hmm. It just, I don't know. I just found that, I found that so funny now as a, as an adult person. Next category is, could this be remade as a 10 episode Netflix show? Well, they just remade it as a BET show. So the answer is yes, it can. But should it? Well, the could they have done a better version of it? I don't know. Hallie, executive producer, said, I'm going to say anything bad. Probably unanswerable questions. How is Keith Sweat not on the soundtrack? That's my first oh. one. It's the time. It's the era. I don't know I what an, he did. I have, an, I have an answer for you. Okay. The answer is that B Babyface did this, right? Yep. Keith Sweat was really a New Jack Swing artist. Teddy, Teddy Riley. Well, but you know, I've had a lot of it's conversations a, about this. Mm -hmm. It's funny that, okay, I, I don't know. This isn't really an answer, but like Babyface, there is some debate between Teddy and Babyface and Jimmy and Terry about, and with like a, like a smidge of Dallas Austin about who, who really, who that music really belongs to like who, new jack swing I, I know we all think it's teddy Whoa! i know we all think it's teddy but i'm just saying that's a great answer van i i'm with you i would have said Ooh. that he belongs to teddy riley that would have been my answer yeah I don't, Ooh, I don't know that's a whole different podcast like that's, that would that's spicy that's a whole different podcast you want to talk I've about some verses before. Right, yeah, that's a whole different podcast. But basically, you, you, yeah, that's not what's saying. Like you know, Babyface did this kind of, and Keith Sweat was a little bit new on, on the New Jack Swing vibe. So that's probably why you didn't see him on the soundtrack. Well, that leads me to my second question: Why is it Chardet on this on this uh, <laughs> on this <laughs> on this soundtrack? Chardet, Chardet, Chardet. Why did Chardé. I say Chardet? Wow. I did the because Boston that's what pronunciation. Lots of people. You might be because you're showing Chardet. your black bill. <laughs> Chardet. Chardet. Uh, uh, but this was peak Chardet. Peak. Yeah, I don't know. I, what, what, I, I, I mean, don't know. the PM Dawn song is. Is a Sade song, basically. Is a Sade song, yes. basically. Ding, 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 ding. I would have brought Sade or Keith Sweat in there for one of the sex scenes, just because. <laughs> That, right. th those were the soundtracks for most of the sex going on in the early 90s, along with Enigma and Enya. Um, oh, yeah. More unanswerable questions. What do you think Robin Givens' character said to undermine Marcus in the office after they broke up, where he becomes this big laughing stock after they've had sex? She what told him exactly what is he... unfolding there? She is told it... him what, ha what he did when he came and that he cried like a baby and sucked his thumb. I've thought about this. You think that's told, what it was? She told the rest of the girls in the office that he that he that he he had the orgasm. He cried like a baby. He sucked his thumb. He asked for his mom, and that's what they were laughing at. Guaranteed. So she was saying he was great in bed, but this funny but, thing happened. But this funny thing happened. Like, I, do you guys know that? Like, when he comes, he sucks on his thumb and like asked for his mother and wanted to be held. 
like the whole nine, like she told them that and it changed their, it fundamentally changed their opinion of Marcus Graham. So do you think you should have had one of the ladies in the office suck their thumb and start laughing and walk away? (laughs) Missed opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Givens does this to Marcus and Mike Tyson. Do you think they thought of her in this movie because she basically took Mike Tyson's mojo too? And they were like, well, who do we get? Who's the the clearest example of somebody who just took someone's mojo? We'll get Robin Givens. It's got to be related. Can't be an accident. <laughs> for sure. He's Let's fumbling for his biggest, mouthpiece in Tokyo two years after they break up. Um, the biggest dragon lady we can find. Yeah, I guess so. Any uh, unanswerable questions for you before we go to who won the movie? Nothing. No. All right. Who no. won the movie? Van Lathan, who won the movie? Uh, Hallie did. Oh. Wow. wow. Really? Yeah. Now nah, that's you're just sucking up to Hallie in case she's listening. I'm not. I know what you're up to. You want to be you want to be her third her third husband. Three. We we we're past Four? three. Are we not? Fourth husband. Like, Justice Martinez. Oh, I guess it would be three. Well, what about the other guy, Gabriel Aubrey? Did they like? So I think she was on three. Well, she was, was with the guy, guy from Unfaithful. Remember that guy, the French guy. Yeah, he yeah, named Olivier him. Martinez. That's, that's Martinez. Yeah, and then she was with some dentist dude, some other guy, some yeah. So and two I love fought. that there is I like, like I always enjoyed that. There, there's a fight between two of them. I uh, love it was Gabriel Aubrey and Olivia Martinez, and he beat the dog shit. Olivia Martinez comes, no, he's pretty face, but he comes from a family of art like Argentine boxers or something like that. And he and whipped he, his ass. He, yeah. Tore his ass up on Thanksgiving Day. Beat the trash out of him. What happened? I don't even know about this. Yeah, there was a big oh, it was a baby daddy dog. fight. Baby daddy fight. Like, uh, Olivier Martinez, we covered it. Olivier Martinez pulled up, uh, excuse me, Gabriel Aubrey pulled up on Thanksgiving or something like that. And Olivier was there, and he just lost it on him and beat the shit out of him. He's a boxer. He can right. fight, for real. Wesley, right. you don't follow baby daddy fights on Twitter? I, you know, people's no, that's not a personal I'm lives that up. do not interest me. <laughs> I, I mean, I just right. don't want to know too much because <laughs> right, the more you know, it. the more you know. I just, I don't know. All right. So Van says Hallie won the movie. What do you think, Wesley? Uh, I'm glad he said that. I'm going to go with Hallie. I'm going to go with Eddie Murphy because okay. Eddie Murphy won the movie. I think the movie changes his, I mean, he, he, he had to, I mean, I don't know how much fighting to do it he had to do, but like. He really had to be present for its making in a way that he, that would have been kind of new for him. Um, I think it liberates him to, to, to go other more interesting places, even if they didn't always work. I think his, it sort of reinvested his interest in, in black familyhood and black culture, um, like on screen, like the, the, the depiction of black life um, and whatever we mean by a black experience, it was more present in his movies after this movie than it was previously. And he's just really good. Like, yeah. this is just a really good comedic performance. It has a lot of tenderness and a lot of vulnerability and also a lot of um, purpose. Like, he understands who this guy is, and this guy is not Eddie Murphy. Like, he is, Marcus is a character for him to play. Um, yeah. And I also he's have really uh, wonderful in it. I also have Eddie winning the movie, and I don't know if it's his best performance ever. What but I think it's be? his. I think it's his best adult performance because I look at the I, the icons: Forty Eight Hours, Training Places, Beverly Hills Cop, Coming to America. He's still pretty young in those movies, you know. Like he's impossibly young. He's he's like twenty one, twenty two when yeah. he makes Forty Eight Hours. He's twenty four yeah. when he makes Beverly Hills Cop. <clears throat> He's like a grown ass adult man in Boomerang. And I think this is the best. He uses all the pieces and I think they get the most out of him. And I think he makes the most people better in the movie too, which we mm-hmm. discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, the, the going- reason why I think it's Hallie real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the reason why I think it's Hallie real quick is because number one, she's a hidden star of this movie at the end of the, at the end of the, at the end of the movie, it's her love story, right? This it's the stickiest role that she had had to that day. When I say stickiest, I mean like a lot of the other roles that we're going to see Halle Berry have really before then and really after then, um, with the possible exception of Jungle Freeper, are kind of empty calories. 
I feel like in a lot of ways, her reputation um, uh, to a large segment of people was buoyed by this movie and it lasted for a long time. We didn't really get another sticky Halle Berry role for a second. So uh, even though it took her a long time to march to the, to the A-list, I don't feel like she has the opportunity to get there unless she delivers in this film. Mm-hmm. Well, remember, don't be pussy whipped. Whip that pussy. <laughs> Boomerang. <laughs> 28 years old. Amazingly. I can't believe this movie is 28 years old. I feel like it's been in it my entire life. Uh, an all timer for me. I just love it. Van Lath and Wesley Morris. Thanks so much. I love uh, talking thanks. about this with you guys. See you guys. 